turn on the mic, come to order. Um, I want to thank our witness for being here. I apologize uh, for running late. We will get started as quick as we can here. I will do my opening statement. And I understand Mr. Kucinich is he's on his way. Good. Um, and I, and I just saw Darrell, I think Chairman Ice is on his way as well. American auto companies have long been a symbol of the industrial vigor that has made our country strong and prosperous. Generations of Americans have worked for General Motors and Chrysler. They should be proud of their service. We are here today because of, in late 2008 the Federal Government took extraordinary actions to intervene in America's automotive industry. Among firms that were bailed out was General Motors, which received roughly $50 billion in taxpayer-funded assistance. This decision and its aftermath fundamentally remade the way our government interacts with the private sector. Dangerous precedents have been established, and understanding the consequences of the government's actions leading up to and during the bailout is essential to figuring out the path forward. Taxpayers will end up billions of dollars short due to the money given to GM, and it is far from clear that the bailout has succeeded in its goals of revitalizing the company. Megan McArdle of The Atlantic has found that we could have given every hourly GM employee 250000 and still come out on top. Furthermore, the bailout of GM desecrated the rule of law. The bankruptcy proceedings that occurred were simply a patchwork legal, ve legal vehicle for delivering ownership shares in the auto companies due uh, to the government. What may have seemed expedient at the time disregarded the true intent of our bankruptcy process. In the end, the auto bailouts set a precedent that will make it more difficult for major companies to go through bankruptcy proceedings in the future, resulting in serious moral hazard. It wasn't even clear these actions were legal in the first place. After Congress failed to pass legislation to allow for the bailout, only then did President Bush move to do so under the Troubled Asset Relief Program. However, TARP was designed to purchase troubled assets from any financial institution on such terms and conditions as determined by the Secretary. Todd Zawicki, a legal expert and professor at George Mason University, has pointed out, quote, TARP legislation did not permit the use of the allotted funds to bail out automakers. The car companies, after all, were not financial institutions. We are pleased today to be joined by Mr. Ronald Bloom, who led the President's Auto Task Force. Before a Congressional Oversight Panel in 2009, Mr. Bloom stated, from the beginning of this process, the President gave the Auto Task Force a clear message. The first was to behave in a commercial manner by ensuring that all stakeholders were treated fairly and received neither more nor less than they would have simply because the government was involved. The second was to refrain from intervening in the day-to-day -day management of those companies. This hearing is taking place today largely because we believe that both of those directives were, were flouted. The Committee believes there is substantial evidence that decisions made by the Administration in the handling of the GM bailout were often politically motivated and that, to the detriment of many, government chose winners and losers. The treatment of Delphi pension epitomizes the picking of winners and losers that occurred in the GM bailout. One group, hourly unionized employees, is still receiving their full pension, while another group, salaried nonunion employees, is receiving just a portion of their pensions as a result of decisions made in the Treasury orchestrated bankruptcy process. The American people have a right to know that their money was not used to advance political ends and that every dollar was loaned with the intention of getting GM on a sustainable course to repay the Treasury. With that, I will yield back our time. And let us go to Mr. Cummings while we wait for Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing is entitled Lasting Impl Implications of the General Motors Bailout. Without question, the most significant lasting implications of the Federal assistance to General Motors are the hundreds of thousands of jobs saved and the hundreds of American communities spared for, uh, further suffering in the midst of the economic recession. On July 5, 2009, the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of New York issued a decision concluding that if the Federal Government had not come to GM's aid, the firm would have liquidated. The Court wrote, and I quote, there are no merger partners, acquirers, or investors willing and able to acquire GM's businesses other than the United States Treasury and Canada's Export Credit Agency. There are no lenders willing and able to finance GM's continued operations, end of quote. GM's liquidation would have been a significant loss to this country and would have been devastating to every community that is home to, G to a GM plant or a GM part supplier or a GM dealer. Faced with this crisis, the Bush administration extended $4 billion to GM in December 2008 and additional uh, $5.4 billion in January 2009. When the Obama administration took over, they required as a condition of additional aid that both GM and Chrysler implement viable plans to reduce their costs and effectively compete in a changed auto industry. 
After extensive restructuring, the new GM quickly exited bankruptcy in July 2009. The results of our Nation's investments are now becoming clear. The first quarter of 2011 was GM's fifth consecutive profitable quarter. According to Robert Scott, an economist with the Economic Policy Institute, and I quote, Federal, State, and local governments save between $10 and $78 for every dollar invested in the auto industry restructuring plan, end of quote. The value of our investment in the auto industry becomes even clearer when we consider the cost of inaction. According to the Center for Automated Motor Research, even a 50 percent reduction in the operations of the big three automakers could have reduced personal income by more than $275 billion over three years, resulting in a loss of more than $100 billion in State and Federal tax revenues. The Federal Government's investment saved hundreds of thousands of jobs and gave these automakers a new lease on life. The committee will hear today from one of the principal architects of our investment in the auto industry, Mr. Ron Bloom, and I welcome his testimony. I also welcome the testimony of our other witnesses, former uh, Congressman uh, Vince uh, Snowbarger uh, with the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, Daniel Eikenson with the Cato Institute, Mishika Dalmia, Dalmia with the Reason Foundation, and Dr. Thomas uh, Koken. With, the, with MIT. We will also hear from Bruce Gump, the Vice Chairman of the Delphi Salary Retirees Association. Delphi is a, is a parts uh, manufacturing company spun off from GM in 1999. By 2005, it had filed for bankruptcy, and in 2009, the, the PGBC took over the company's pension plans. GM agreed to top up the pensions of the employees of Delphi main unions meaning they will receive the pensions they were promised. But such top-ups were not provided to Delphi's salaried employees or certain other union employees. Given the statutory limits on the benefits that the P PBGC can pay, many, Delphi, many of Delphi's salary retirees are receiving benefits that are far lower than, than promised by Delphi. The consequences of these shortfalls to salaried retirees are truly heartbreaking, particularly as these employees have also lost their health coverage. This, <clears throat> this matter is, however, the subject of ongoing litigation that makes the PBGC as a defendant, that names the PBGC as a defendant. Mr. Bloom is also being sued, not just in his official capacity, but as an individual citizen whose personal assets are on the line. Obviously, this will prevent him from answering questions on this matter, a situation I hope everyone will respect. Again, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you uh, for this hearing. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Bill Johnson, be allowed to participate in today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. And now recognize the other gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also want to thank our ranking member, another fellow Ohioan, Member Kucinich, uh, for holding this hearing and um, for the importance, really, of the issues that we are addressing today. I was very disappointed to hear that the administration has prohibited Mr. Bloom from speaking to us on the important issues of Delphi's pensions. I was hoping to hear Mr. Bloom explain the administration's plan for finally restoring the hard-earned retirement benefits of Delphi salaried workers from across the country. Two weeks ago, the White House unveiled a report entitled Resurgence of the American Automotive Industry, and President Obama paid a visit to Toledo, Ohio. Uh, what neither report noted, nor did the President mention, was the administration's plan to restore benefits to the Delphi retirees. I believe it is because there isn't one. The uh, administration picked winners and losers uh, where the pensions of many salary Delphi workers were lost. This was done without any explanation, without any justification, or without any basis. And today, it is still being done without any answers. Now, I, I beg to differ. Um, litigation does not prohibit Mr. Bloom from answering. What prohibits Mr. Bloom from answering is that perhaps the answers or the truth might be damaging in litigation. 
and that being it would be damaging because these Delphi retirees are entitled to these benefits. These benefits were wrongly taken from them, and they deserve an answer. We live in a government where the government is responsive to the people. Things can't happen in secret. The administration picked winners and losers, and not only do the taxpayers need to know, because taxpayers' money was involved, but certainly these Delphi retirees deserve an answer. But more importantly, they deserve the restoration of these benefits. Almost 15,000 salaried retire workers, some of which are, were denied up to 70 percent of their pensions, all of them 100 percent of their life insurance and 100 percent of their health insurance. It is devastating to them. It is an action that was done by this administration while they were picking winners and losers. And it is one that needs to be addressed by the administration, not only just in providing answers, which is what we are seeking today, but also in solving. These workers deserve to have their pensions restored. Uh, now, pursuant to this hearing, we have the ability to um, try to provide additional opportunities for, for Mr. Bloom. Uh, Mr. Snowberger, to, uh, to answer questions. Um, I am uh, going to present today, and please, I have got a staff member who is going to present to Mr. Bloom and Mr. Snowbarger. Um, 25 questions for Mr. Bloom, 30 questions for Mr. Snowbarger. I would appreciate if you would respond to these questions. They are the types that gonna, you are going to be receiving today from members. They go directly to this issue of the Delphi uh, retirees and um, salaried workers, and we would appreciate your finally attending to give them the information that, that they deserve. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing, and we look forward to getting some answers for these retirees. I thank the gentleman from Ohio for his statement and uh, for his uh, being here today and his hard work on this issue. And the other gentleman from uh, Ohio, my good friend Mr. Kucinich, is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a statement by our colleague, Congressman Kildee. Uh, so, so without objection, so ordered, uh, well, if I could just interrupt for one second. While we are doing that, I ask unanimous consent to submit a letter from Senator Portman and Representative Camp and a study done by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Without objection, so ordered. Thank Gentlemen's you very record. much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. This is a chance to conduct oversight, but it is also a chance to take stock of a critical and successful government intervention. The Federal Government saved two companies, GM and Chrysler, and probably an entire region of the country. I come from that region. There is a GM factory located east of Cleveland called Lordstown. In March 2009, the community of Lordstown, Ohio, was profiled by CBS News in this way. They said, quote, holding on for dear life, where 70 percent of the ta town's tax base came from the GM plant, according to the mayor. Just last month, the CBS News story profiled this community in a completely different light talked about it being jolted back to life by 4,000 pounds of steel. The Lordstown GM plant was essentially dead for a short period of time, without a single car being manufactured. <clears throat> but it is now alive and employing around 4,500 people. Those workers are using parts made down the road in my district. R roughly 20 percent of the parts from the GM Parma Metal Center in my district go to Lordstown for the manufacturing of the Chevy Cruze. The interconnectedness of the region doesn't stop there. The Parma GM metal plant buys equipment from the automatic feed company of Napoleon, Ohio, to make auto parts, sustaining yet another Ohio workforce. The web of connections goes on and on in communities responsible for the parts, materials, equipment, goods, and services that the auto industry, the workers, and their families depend upon. Whether or not this web survived or was torn apart was at stake in late 2008 and throughout 2009. Thankfully, the Bush administration decided rightly to make the first loans, and the current administration built on what the Bush administration did with more financial support for the restructuring of the industry and its successful emergence from bankruptcy. The most important point I hope we remember throughout this hearing is a calamity which was averted for these communities through our investment in the auto industry. Without that investment, as many as 3.3 million U.S. jobs may have been lost, amounting to between uh, 0.5 percent and 3 percent yearly reduction in gross domestic product from 2009 through 2011. Second, I hope we remember it was absolutely necessary for us to act expeditiously. <clears throat> if GM, for instance, excuse me, <clears throat> were to have languished in a prolonged bankruptcy, so too would communities like Lordstown and many others languish in ruin as the jobs, revenue, and tax base for essential <laughs> community services evaporate. In the light of the success achieved by our support for GM, 
This hearing will also examine a difficult situation faced by workers and retirees of GM parts suppliers Delphi. Being mindful of the ongoing litigation on this issue, in fairness to the other witnesses testifying at the hearing, I welcome the opportunity to hear testimony from Bruce Gump of the Del Delphi Salary Retirees Association on a truly difficult situation that has been experienced by the individuals that organization represents. Mr. Chairman, on this point, before I yield, other committees, such as Education and Labor, as long ago as, November, as December 2009, have heard testimony on the fact that certain retirees of Delphi, such as salaried retirees, as well as retirees represented by a number of unions, lost their benefits through Delphi's bankruptcy because they had no agreements to have their benefits topped up to the level they have worked for and deserved. It is a very painful situation, and I know it is an issue that concerns you as well, Mr. Chairman. And while I appreciate Mr. Gum coming here, I think what we need to do is to uh, determine a course of action that would solve the problem. So, so I would ask you if uh, we could work together sure. on legislation that would correct the situation and consider whether or not that legislation would enable the topping up of benefits of all the uh, Delphi retirees and the union retirees who saw their benefits disappear in Delphi's bankruptcy. Um, I, I don't. Uh, uh, you know, we, we're, we're going to need to have some kind of action, and just in the time that I have remaining, if the, uh, um, I'd ask the gentleman if, if we could work together to do something here. I always look forward to working with the gentleman from uh, from Cleveland, and uh, working with you and other members from the Ohio delegation and surrounding states and in, in, in Congress on what is the best approach moving forward. Um, so I appreciate the uh, gentleman's statement. I, I'd, I'd like to work with you and other members of the committee on this, and as Ohioans, I think we have a chance to. Uh, reaffirm our support, uh, not just for automotive, but America's manufacturing base has been at risk. And while I joined with you in, in fighting the bailouts to Wall Street, which just produces paper, uh, we are talking about people who produce cars, people who make steel, aerospace products, shippers, manufacturing. American manufacturing uh, is something we ought to be investing in. And I want to thank the Chair for holding this hearing so we can get, get into these issues. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his statement. I would just point out before recognizing Mr. Kelly for an opening statement that um, uh, highlighting the Lordstown facility, uh, which we are all genuinely you know, glad that it is still operating and jobs are there and it has helped that community, um, underscores what took place here. There were winners and losers selected. We have just down the road in Mansfield, Ohio, a GM facility that was closed. And what we are trying to get at was were these decisions made by General Motors or were they, in fact, made by the auto task force and people in the government, not only picking winners and losers and who they are going to provide money to, but also getting into the day-to-day -day operations of the company and decide which facilities would stay open and which ones would, uh, would not? That is an important question and one that I think we need answered as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now I yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having this hearing. Uh, as someone who was uh, very close to the situation being a Chevrolet Cadillac dealer, and going through that process, uh, the thing that does bother me is we will really never know if General Motors could have survived on its own. Because the General Motors that I know, the General Motors that my dad started with as a parts picker in the 30s and went through a war and came back home and was able to rise uh, through the, the organization and buy his own dealership, and I am talking about not a huge dealership but a one-car showroom in a little town called Verona and, and build into something we were very proud of. Uh, through hard work, through hard work. Not that somebody picked that he was going to be a winner or said, no, you, you don't have an opportunity. That never happened to him, but it did happen to me. It was after the government takeover of General Motors uh, in, a, in a business that we worked very hard to build for 56 years. I got a phone call, and in five minutes, 56 years of work and saving and putting everything on the line was pretty much taken away. I got a phone call said, listen, you know what, where are you? And I said, I am sitting at my desk. And I said, well, I am in Detroit. I am with a lawyer and I am recording this. And we need you to sign that document we sent you yesterday. I said, you are talking about the 39 pages? Absolutely. I said, I am not signing it. I said, why not? I said, because I refuse to give up my franchise. I said, well, that is really not up to you. We have made a decision. And I said, well, you know what, I, I got to tell you, it is up to me. It is up to the people that, the 100 and some people that work with me every day. Uh, and to have somebody make a phone call and tell me that you are no longer going to be a dealer because of a decision that was made, not by car people, but by government, not by people who have any skin in the game, not by people who have put their whole life on the line, but by people who made a decision based on some type of a, of a metric that I absolutely have no idea where it came from. 
And then when you say, hey, I'm, I'm going to fight you, I'm going to go to arbitration for somebody to laugh at you and say, are you kidding me? You, Mike Kelly, Butler, Pennsylvania, with your limited resources and one lawyer against the United States government, you don't have a snowball's chance in hell of making it. I said, you know what, I'll take those odds. I'll take those odds. So uh, we got through it, went to arbitration, got the dealership back. By the way, the, my friends that didn't go to arbitration are no longer in business, not because they couldn't make it in the open market, because government decided they would go out of business. That is not America. And we will never know if General Motors could have made it on its own. They followed a Judas goat. They said, yeah, come with us. We'll lend you the money. We'll help you. And these gentlemen could fly into Washington and are berated because their plan doesn't make sense by the same people that are $14.3 trillion in the red telling these guys they don't know how to run a business. So my question is, where does it lie? Where, what really could have happened? Because in my opinion, the government's the one that picked and cho chose who was going to win, who was going to lose. And so from my standpoint, Mr. Chairman, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here today from somebody who's been able to get through some very difficult times. And we're now in our 60th year, not because of uh, things that we've done separately, but things that we've done collectively as an organization. And through the grace of God, we've been able to get through it. But I do wonder the direction of the country. And when we place our fate and our future in the hands of those who have never done it, who have never walked in our shoes, who have never done the things we've done, but who have, do have the ability to open a laptop and tell you you're no longer in business. That's not the American way. I don't accept it. My father certainly wouldn't have accepted it. And I think it's, it's time to shed some light on this. So I thank you for doing what you're doing because we are here, truly, to make sure that the job creators, the small business people, have an opportunity to compete and that it's not taken out of their hands by somebody who's never, ever had any skin in the game. So I thank you, sir. Thank the gentleman for his opening statement. And, um, well, now uh, I think what we're going to have to do is swear in our witnesses. And I apologize, guys. It's one of those days. We'll swear you in. It's a custom of the committee to do that. And then uh, we're going to have to take a brief recess, hopefully brief, to go vote. And then we'll be back for questioning. We'll try to be as accommodating with your time. We understand you're busy as well. But uh, unfortunately, we do have three votes on the floor. So if you'll uh, uh, just rise and um, Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Let the record show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. We have with us today, uh, first, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ron Bloom, a former senior advisor to the Secretary of the Treasury, the U.S. Department of Treasury, now working as a uh, um, senior manufacturing uh, advisor to the President, I believe. And then uh, also Mr. Vince Snowbarger is uh, the deputy director of the Pension Benefits Guarantee Corporation and a former member of Congress from New York State? Kansas. Why did I have New York? I had that in my mind. It was in Kansas. Long way from New York, Kansas, right? Still a great state. We appreciate you both being here. We are going to stand in recess for probably 30, 35, 40 minutes, and then we will be, we'll be back.